Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. If I looked at my watch now, it would say 12 noon on a Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and we're doing energy. Mina, Marita, Marco Mangelsdorf, and me on Monday. M M M M M M M. And here they are, uh, the, the daring duo, duo, well, maybe trio if you include me. And we're going to talk about energy in Hawaii. There's so many things to discuss. Mina, good morning. Good Monday morning. Aloha from Kauai. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Marco. Uh, on, on this beautiful. <laughs> it is a beautiful day. One day closest to real, closer to real st uh, sustainability. Uh, Marco, how yeah. about you? Where are you in, in uh, Hilo today? Well, much aloha to my favorite M and J there uh, from uh, beautiful Hilo town. So it's always a pleasure to have the terrific trio, the terrific triad uh, on the same show. So uh, thanks again for having uh, me on and both of us on, Jay. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Well, let's go. We have a, we have a, a lot of stuff to cover. Let's talk about the permit report first. Uh, <clears throat> when we spoke, uh, Marco, you mentioned that Oahu PV permits uh, for February, we're up from 2017. What, is it, what happened? What does it mean? Well, the good news, I think, uh, I'd like to believe, even though two months perhaps don't necessarily make uh, for a trend quite yet, but I, I believe and I very much want to believe that the Hawaii solar coaster bottomed out last year and is now building up some upward momentum after years of, of slowdown. So last last month in February, Honolulu Department of Planning and Permitting issued 194 permits for solar electric systems compared to 154 in February 2017, which is an increase in in 26 percent. And another notable data point from those numbers is that 60 percent of those 194 permits issued last month, 60 percent included battery storage. So nowhere else in the country is residential energy storage being deployed as part of uh, new PV systems as vigorously as we're seeing here. It's also worth noting on the macro level, the energy storage arena has become, in my opinion, one of the hottest energy playing fields in the world. You've got the uh, Tesla Gigafactory outside of Reno, which I was uh, uh, surprised to see has the largest, the largest building on the planet when you look at the total footprint of the Gigafactory uh, over in uh, Reno, outside of Reno. Uh, and it's just one of a number of, of a growing number of battery, what I'll call battery mega factories, either under construction or on the drawing board in uh, People's Republic of China and the Republic of Korea, also known as South Korea. So there's no doubt in my mind that the volume of energy storage hitting the global market is going up exponentially and hopefully will be accompanied by declining prices. So it's coming at an opportune time, I think. And and the supports, uh, like I said, the, the solar coaster, hopefully having bottomed out last year, and we're now uh, beginning to inch up in the positive direction. <clears throat> you know, you say that the uh, photovoltaic permits are up and all that two, two months in a row. But um, just I wonder if you have metrics to indicate how, how the um, you know, utility scale solar activity is doing. Is it also up two months in a row? Well, that's a far, far different uh, playing field and a far different timeline, Jay. Uh, Hawaiian Electric has issued uh, requests for proposals, if I'm not mistaken. I believe that has been formally put out there for 200 plus megawatts, I believe, of renewable energy for Oahu, which can be wind or solar, amongst other things. Uh, 40 megawatts of utility scale renewable for Maui, 20 plus megawatts for the Big Island. And those uh, particular, that scale of projects involves a lot more uh, money, a lot more effort, a lot more organizing, and a much longer, longer timeline because all of them, all such projects, if I'm not mistaken, have to be subject to Public Utilities Commission approval. So over the next 12, 24, 36 months, I have no doubt there's going to be substantially more megawatts of utility scale renewables, but it's going to take um, considerably longer to have those actually go in on the ground. I want to talk about uh, Senate Bill 2100 pending in the legislature this, this uh, session, but in ramping up to that, I'd like to talk about the governor's uh, budget. 
which was 200 and, and change a million dollars short. Uh, what kind of um, environment, Mina, do we have uh, with a budget that's $200 million short in a state where the Constitution requires a balanced budget every year? Well, definitely one of the things that you can't identify w without a balanced budget is the governor's priority. So I think it, we're in a sad state where he's going to rely on the legislature to make the cuts to his budget in order to balance the budget. Mm. So, you know, here you have an administration which hasn't identified its priorities. Yeah, it's a problem. We need, we need, we need to have uh, leadership on that. So how does this affect mm -hmm. Senate Bill 2100? Uh, it's a very important bill ha having to do with energy. Well, for the at least the third year in a row, as we've discussed before, there is uh, a bill that's active in the Hawaii legislature right now, which would change the current renewable energy, state renewable energy tax credit uh, values up until now. Uh, there is no sunset date to that, uh, that tax credit. And as I've pointed out in the past, it has accounted for the largest uh, sum of money not going to the general fund to the tune of uh, from 2013, 14, and 15, the three most recent years that I have data for, those three years amounted to almost half a billion dollars, somewhere close to $500 million worth of tax credits claimed. So when you talk about a shortfall in the governor's proposed budget of $200 million, I mean, that's not chump change, mm -hmm. and any type of tax credit is going to be some hit on uh, money going to the state's general fund. So Senate Bill 2100 is, uh, again, the third attempt in three years on the part of uh, various legislators to, uh, to do two things, in my opinion. One is to change the renewable energy tax credit uh, law and change the, the, the tax credit values and also put, uh, put a sunset date or ramp down, uh, ramp down rate on people being able to claim. In other words, not have it be good in perpetuity. And then the second point from 2100 would be establishing a separate state tax credit to add energy storage uh, after one, whether the one is a homeowner or business owner, uh, providing a state tax credit to add energy storage after having installed a renewable energy facility. The bill uh, went from the, the Senate, passed the Senate a couple, three weeks ago, was heard in Chris Lee's Energy and Environment Committee uh, a couple weeks ago, actually on the 15th, was passed out of uh, uh, the Energy and Environment Committee on the 15th and has now been been forwarded to or, or referred to uh, Sylvia Luke's Finance Committee, which they have to hold hearings no later than, well, they don't have to hold the hearing. She could defer uh, and not agree to hold the hearing, but I, I believe it will. There will be a hearing on it either this week or next week uh, as we enter into the last month of the ledge, which is uh, in April prior to the ledge or just legislature closing down for the year, essentially by uh, in the first few days of, of May. So, you know, you know there are going to be unhappy people amongst what I call the solar parties in terms of uh, the way the Senate Bill 2100 uh, HD1, House Draft 1, is written now that would bring the credit down to 25 percent from 35 percent. And you know, the, the kind of the iron law is that once you have a subsidy or an incentive, that particular industry that benefits from it is loath to give it up. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I, I'm okay with it as a small biz PV uh, company, small business owner. And I think it's more than offset, would be more than offset by a separate tax credit for energy storage if, in fact, this bill were to get through the legislature and end up on the governor's desk. Yeah. Well, Mina, how do you feel about it? What parts do you like? Well, I hope, you know, I, I like the ramp down, of course. I don't like the idea of a special or a separate um, tax credit for battery. Uh, I don't believe people should double dip on the tax credit regarding a, um, a, a solar system, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the entire system that, you know, um, batteries should be a part of it. And it is now, my understanding, the way it's interpreted, you know, the, the, um, the tax credit 
can already be inclusive of a battery system when it's designed as part of the system. But for those who have taken the tax credit earlier, I, I, I feel like they're um, being overly subsidized. Um, by taking a se second tax credit, and many of these, these systems already benefit from net metering. So mm -hmm. you have subsidization from the taxpayer as well as the rate payer mm -hmm. um, well, that, that needs to be considered. Yeah, and, and, you know, given the state budget and the impact of the state, state budget, I mean, it, this is a huge issue. Uh, uh, that should be looked at carefully. Let me uh, let me shift to other pieces of legislation that are being in, that are in play. One is the barrel tax. As in every year, there are very various um, proposals about mm, redistributing what comes in on the barrel tax, changing the rate of the barrel tax, and all that. Um, where the barrel tax was originally intended to incentivize yeah. green energy, now it seems to go in a lot of different directions. And no. it might go in even further directions uh, this this season. What what what's happening? Well, I I I think it's really difficult at this point to um, go in and ask for an know. increased barrel tax, um, and mainly because you know if you're looking at an administration that is not showing any kind of leadership. How can you justify that these monies are going to be spent wisely? We've had a really critical auditor's report on the energy office. Um, I'm not sure what the priorities are at Department of Agriculture. Um, and I'm not sure what the overall uh, strategy is on energy and food security. And um, you know, sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for when you open up Pandora's box yeah. uh, at the legislature. Yeah, true. So you might you might go in for a redistribution or an increase of the barrel tax and come out less. <laughs> the bill might be used as a vehicle for something else. So, Marco, where uh, are you on the yeah. barrel tax? Where, where do you think about it? Uh, I haven't been following it all that much, but I mean, uh, I, I kind of think to that other, gosh, what was it? Was it a tax on cigarettes that was supposed to go 100% towards um, trying to reduce uh, uh, pushback on people buying tobacco products? And, and the legislature sees a pot of money like that, and they start picking at it and, and diverting it in other directions. I mean, it sounds similar to, to what the barrel tax uh, has suffered, is that you have a— um, uh, something of an appropriation that's specifically targeted to achieve a certain goal, and once the, the money starts developing in a kitty, so to speak, then there are hungry eyes that look at it and say, well, gee, I have a place. I'd like to spend some of that money, too. <laughs> well, this, this certainly raises yeah. the issue of GEMS. The Green Energy Infrastructure uh, Fund started out at $150 million on um, what bonds uh, guaranteed by the ratepayers, and— uh, before you know it, yeah. the legislature is taking huge pieces out for uh, issues that are not really purposes that are not really related to the original intention. Um, uh, Mina, what do you think about yeah. what's happening to GEMS? Yeah, yeah I, you know, the thing, when GEMS was proposed by DBED, and this is under the Abercrombie administration, those funds were supposed to be deployed immediately. You know, they're supposed to have all of these programs lined up. And, you know, at the time I was at the PUC and we were very concerned because the saturation of, of PV panels already on the system. I mean, and, and so were you going to get many subscribers there for, for the GEMS program? And, you know, here, here we're at. Four years later, you know, the money is sitting there. We're paying interest on these bonds. Uh, the, the energy office is in disarray. Uh, you know, what can I say? It's screwed up. Mm. Let's and, talk. Let's talk. Let's, you know, the, 
the best thing that they can do is find one big project and deploy the funds for that one big project. And people have to remember, these bonds have to be repaid. And, and so you have to find an uh, income-producing project um, that can pay off the, the, the bonds. Yeah, amen to that. We're going to take a short break, you guys. Um, Marco Mangelsdorf, Mina Morita. Um, Marco, uh, Mina, and Marco and me on Energy on Mondays. We'll be right back after this short break. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Hey, aloha, Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy and transportation, Energy and maritime, energy and aviation, we have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. <music> You're back on Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, our energy show on Monday. Uh, Mina, Marco, and me on Monday, of course. And so uh, we'd like to take the second half of the show today and talk about a whole spate of things that affect the PUC. Um, the first thing is, uh, gee whiz, uh, David Ige's nomination for a six-year term uh, of a new PUC commissioner. This would replace uh, Lorraine Akiba, I guess. Um, goodbye, Lorraine. Thank you for your effort and your service over the past, what, six years? And hello, Jennifer, Jennifer Potter. So, Marco, what do you think about this appointment? Well, considering, or at least I consider myself at least uh, partially uh, a wonk uh, as well, Jay, I, 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 I applaud the governor's choice because I think uh, Jay Griffin, uh, who he appointed last year to, uh, to take, uh, take over for, for Mike Champley, uh, that Jay was a winner. And uh, I'm in favor of more wonks. I mean, he could have chosen a politician. He could have chosen a lawyer. And choosing a person who brings quite the pedigree that she does is uh, Jenny Potts, uh, as far as uh, experience in, um, in uh, using analytics to determine kind of the future, president future of uh, utilities in the 21st century, uh, experience with uh, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, also known as SMUD. She seems very, very well qualified. So I, I think, uh, not knowing the woman personally, uh, from what I can tell, she was uh, she was a great choice. And next step is uh, Roz Baker's committee on the Senate. I believe is just one port of call to uh, consider her nomination. And I'm sure Ms. Potts is uh, making the rounds amongst the 25 senators and get a meet and greet. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully, Roz will uh, Senator Baker will schedule a hearing in the weeks to come so that by the time the legislature ends, she will have been confirmed and uh, take over after Lorraine departs on June 30th and 10 uh, Ms. Potts will take over on July 1st. So yeah, I so we don't have a Champley situation here. He appointed early enough in the session so there would be uh, plenty of time for a consent. So we don't, we don't have to go, uh, you know, uh, with the same kind of scenario we had with Mike Champley. But let me ask you this, uh, uh, Marco, you know, uh, Jennifer uh, Potter is, is from HNEI. Uh, so is Jay Griffin from HNEI, essentially, in terms of you know, the way his energy career has developed. Uh, uh, that means two significant, two of three, two of three of the commissioners are from HNEI. Don't we need more diversity? I can't really speak to that, Jay, because I, I'm not enough of an insider to know whether HNEI has particular biases and if so where they are. I think both you and Mina are much more well equipped to kind of know the inside baseball stuff uh, uh, on that particular organization. 
Well, what about you, Mina? What do you think? Well, I think, you know, definitely she has all the qualifications. I, I, I'm glad that they found a woman to replace um, Lorraine for diversity's sake. And my understanding is she lives in Lahaina, so um, that you have a neighbor island perspective coming in. Um, I think people have to, I, you know, there's a real careful balance between re a real life scenario and an academic approach, <laughs> you know, uh, so careful balancing. <laughs> you know, I, I worked a lot with H, HNEI, and part of it is to understand that careful balance, that that you could have technical and economic support coming out of the institute that will address a, a, a real-life situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and so I'm hoping that they will continue on the track, and HNEI has been pretty conservative looking at all issues moving on to um, the current energy policy. Yeah, they're definitely uh, a leadership you know, organization, yeah. So what about the PUC yeah. in general? They've had an audit recently, um, you know, and uh, here we are at a, at a, at a time when there, there's such great expectation from the PUC. Uh, what, what's, the, uh, yeah. what's the tone and tenor of the PUC and its, its position in the energy landscape right now? Well, I, I think you have a careful, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> how can I be diplomatic about this, you know? Um, you have a chair in the past, I mean, you have a chair currently that seems to be more autocratic than collaborative. And so how will he now take these uh, two commissioners with really good background and collaborate with them into resolving issues and attacking these really, again, complex dockets. Um, yeah, w Jenny appears to be highly capable, but she can only be a, as effective as... Uh, the chair allows her to be. Mm, yeah, okay. Marco, you have thoughts on this? I actually was wanted to ask Mina from her very valuable and unique perspective as having been chair of the PUC under uh, Neil Abercrombie, other than uh, you uh, noting uh, more uh, autocratic tendencies under your successor, Randy Awase, compared to your tenure there, Mina, what other tangible differences or changes can you identify and comment on from when you were chair of the PUC to under uh, under Randy's tenure? You know, uh, my, my staff at the PUC was small, and we were in the process of trying to hire to fill positions. But even though with um, a small staff, we had a lot of experience amongst the staff. Going in, you know, four years later, the turnover has been really high at the PUC. A lot of senior people have left the PUC. And so you don't have that, you know, bench of experience and institutional memory, um, and especially with all these rape cases going on. So I think that's a huge difference. What would you attribute um, to the high staff turnover, the high rate of turnover? What would you attribute that to? What's what's the cause? Uh, for a while, it was salaries. You know, the, the, the easiest thing that you could pinpoint to is salaries, that the salaries weren't competitive with um, similar positions, um, uh, in in the private sector, in, in other agencies, uh, you know, staff at DBED gets paid a whole lot more than staff at PUC. Interesting. Um, and, well, and so, 
just the, just the ability to attract and retain. Well, presumably, um, with every change in the composition of the PUC, that their thinking, there's only three of them, uh, will likewise change. And so the last point in our agenda today is uh, HEI's purchase of Hamakua Energy uh, Partners and uh, a new docket to consider, quote, affiliate transactions, end quote. Um, and I wonder, you know, does, does this new uh, commissioner, this, you know, the, the current tone and tenor of the PUC, um, how is it going to react to this docket and other dockets like it? Um, are they more open about this kind of thing? Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts, uh, Mina? Well, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at this docket, but I, you know, it, it appears that HECO was sort of forced into this, this issue of going the route of an affiliate, um, you know, because there was no way that the utility could purchase um, how Makua partners or renegotiate um, uh, a new PPA under the, the circumstances. It didn't look like they were going to get approval. And what's really sad is you have this asset on the big island that really could help, I think, with the integration of renewables because gas turbines um, and and flexible unit compared to other older units um, uh, on the island, maybe a bit more efficient. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think, you know, just this hard, you know, um, uh, position that the, the utility shouldn't be owning these kinds of assets um, may not have made sense given the circumstances of, of an existing facility and an asset that might be just yeah well disregarded Marco let me let me ask you I mean if, and you and you come at this at least in part from HIEC uh, you know looking at the, the whole model of utilities in the state of Hawaii um, how, how does the new composition of the uh, as far as you know the the PUC um, and these new type of deals that are being presented. Uh, what what is there a new world here happening? Is this does this no. signal a new a new direction in in general of development of clean energy? Uh, no, I, I think it's too early to tell for uh, for one thing, Jay. I mean the, the brief history uh, of the past year or two is that Helco had a willing seller uh, from a company called Arclight Capital that owned Hawaii Hamakua Energy Partners, which is the largest generating plant uh, on the island. They had a deal to buy HEP from Arclight that went before the commission. The commission turned it down middle of last year. HEI came up with an alternate strategy where they purchased, they closed the deal with Arclight to purchase HEP as a... Um, uh, affiliated transaction, and that apparently got enough of the attention of the Public Utilities Commission that they said, you know, we need to or we need to open a docket to look at affiliated transaction requirements. So I don't see it necessarily as hostile to HEI's move to acquire HEP, but at the same time, uh, they wanted to revisit something that hasn't really been discussed in quite a number of decades, really, uh, in great detail, going back to the so-called Thomas Report of the early 1990s, uh, as far as Hawaiian Electric Industries mm -hmm. being a non-regulated company. It owns, of course, publicly regulated companies in terms of HECO, HELCO, MECO, but HEI is non-regulated. So they wanted to uh, clearly generate some discussion on the on the, the boundaries of what a company like HEI can or maybe should not do in terms of affiliated transactions. So, uh, and I want to give a shout out to Henry Curtis for bringing this to my attention uh, last week, because he, of course, is all over whatever the commission does, and uh, it's, that's how I got wind of it. So it's uh, it's kind of a sleeper issue. Uh, but it's also very important, I think, in terms of, of of discussion of what a company like HEI can or should do in terms of acquiring assets. And uh, I think part of it is that there's been a general 
kind of poo-pooing of the notion that utility companies should be owning generation assets. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a, a bias against that, a growing bias against that. Yeah, but that. that might be changing, don't you think? Well, I, I don't think it's changing on the mainland, uh, but I think there are people fundamentally who don't think that uh, utilities should be in the generation business, they should be in the T&D, transmission distribution business. But, mm -hmm. you know, that's all well and good on the mainland where you have interconnection from state to state to state to state. We ain't got no okay. such thing here on this island. So I think we're, we're in a very tangibly, materially different position here in this state. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it? I wouldn't do what? This deal. Uh, no, I happen to think it was a brilliant move on the part of HEI to buy HAP. I think it was a very good move. Yeah. I mean, what, would you approve it, is my question. Uh, well, it wasn't subject to approval. Ah. No, um, no, no, I, I, I think um, Marco has a really good point that, you know, we really have to delve into these issues more, you know, about these affiliate transactions. And, and also related to that, whether the generation, I mean, whether generation should be owned by the utility. I mean, they're going around one route because the other route was denied, but we haven't had that really deep discussion um, on our particular situation as an island state and how these kinds of assets should be handled. Wow, fabulous that we have new issues, new possibilities, new wrinkles. Um, Marco, I'm so glad you raised it, and, and good for Henry Curtis for raising it to you. Well, thank you, Marco Mangelsdorf. Thank you, Amina Morita. Great discussion, as always. We'll see you two weeks hence. Don't leave town. Or if you leave town, stay close to a phone anyway. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. Always a pleasure. Thank you both. Thanks. Aloha.